Okay, welcome to the next chapter on energy flow. So we're going to focus on how energy is going to move through an ecosystem and an environment. But there's first we need to look at some laws of thermodynamics. They're also called the laws of bioenergetics. I don't care which term you use, um, so I would accept either term on a quiz or an exam. I'm more familiar with the laws of thermodynamics. Sorry, that's my son coughing. <laughs> um, never a quiet place I can find, but anyway. Um, so the laws of bioenergetics or thermodynamics deals with how energy flows and those energy <coughs> conversions. That's okay. Um, so the energy conversions is taking macromolecules and breaking those down into the building blocks or going the other directions. And it also involves chemical reactions of doing those processes and balancing, make sure all the atoms are accounted for. So we've had these terms before, now we're applying it to ecosystems. So let's look at the first law of thermodynamics. It states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it just changes form. So that's what I was just talking about in terms of taking a macromolecule, going through a chemical reaction, and breaking it down into those building blocks. Now if you look and you study ecology, the first law is always talking about conservation of that energy and matter. So they may write that as this law, but it's still the first law of thermodynamics about energy can't be created or destroyed. So here's just a visual showing that everything is balanced. This um, is representing that all the atoms are accounted for. The only thing that's not in this illustration is that heat is lost into the environment, but we'll see that into some other diagrams. Now, how does this definition of the first law, how does it relate to living organisms? Well, since everything has to be accounted for and you're dealing with chemical reactions, it's really where are these organisms going to get its energy from? And it's always from an outside source. Now we classify organisms based on how they obtain that energy. An autotroph means self, so auto, they make their own food. So this would be our plants. They're getting energy from the sun. They're also going to get carbon dioxide from animals like us and water, and they'll convert that or make their own food, which is glucose. Heterotrophs, you can either say they get it indirectly from the sun, which means they need to eat plants, or they'll get it from other heterotroph or other organisms. So there's two different ways to look at that. Now, we classify organisms, and here we're just focusing on the heterotrophs, how, excuse me, on what they eat. So what these heterotrophs eat. So an herbivore would eat plants. So think of herbs, plants, if you cook with plants. And so they are getting their food or they are eating plants. Now the descriptions behind, like behind plants, this is how you would classify a plant. So plants are producers or called autotrophs. Um, carnivores eat only meat. Those are also heterotrophs. So both carnivore and other heterotrophs. Omnivores would eat both plants and animals. Now we're going to do an activity in class with a worksheet and I have an image of this boy and I don't know who it is, I just googled it, took the picture and I believe he's eating a hot dog and I ask you to classify. Well, as a human species, collectively we are classified as omnivores. Now I'm well aware that there are vegans and vegetarians, but collectively we are classified as omnivores. Now what I've done here is I've given the example of a food chain with a lot of description and what's going on as you go through the process but here a wolf is going to eat a rabbit so the rabbit is a source of energy and nutrients the wolf is going to digest that food and breaking those macromolecules down into building blocks and these should look familiar glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids then through a process of chemical reactions, it's going to further break those down and recombine and make new molecules. Now, there's something called here free energy. We haven't really talked about that, but free energy is the energy that's available that's released into the environment. And the form it's released to into the environment is heat. 
So, you know, like when you walk up to the third floor to my classroom, um, you know, your muscles are kind of warm and you're breathing harder um, and you go through all those muscle contractions. Well, you're giving off more heat because of the chemical reactions and burning that energy. Um, here's just another diagram down here. There's a couple things I wanted to point out illustrating that how important it is to look and read and study the entire diagram. <coughs> just don't look for a couple of things and go from there. So um, here we have heterotrophs, so it's all of these collective organisms. Here are the autotrophs, which are the plants or the producers. Now you'll notice the arrows, they are pointing down or they're saying like this top carnivore is pointing to the secondary, secondary carnivores pointing to the primary carnivore. Now we're going to see later the arrows are going the other direction. But you notice there's a little side note next to each of these, feed on. So it's telling you that these organisms are feeding on the next organism below it. Okay, that's really important. The other thing I wanted to point out, you notice here it says primary consumer. And this also says again primary carnivore. Now, if you were reading this quickly and you just saw primary, primary, secondary, you would study it like that. But if I'm saying primary consumer, that's another word for an herbivore. Now I jump up to the carnivores. Well, this is the first level of carnivores, so it would be primary. If I label these all consumers, then I would continue the numbering primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, etc. Okay, so make sure you read everything and look at it really carefully. So that's the first law of thermodynamics. Now let's look at the second law, which deals with a, a term called entropy. Entropy is disorganization. It's messiness. And nature just tends to move toward that. So when things die, they start to decompose. Well, it becomes really messy and disorganized. <laughs> so entropy is the measurement of that and how that energy is used. Well, at some point in time, there's not going to be any energy available. So, for example, if I have a battery and I'm using it in the remote, and after a while, you know, the remote works half the time and half the time it doesn't, there's still some energy in that battery, but most of the time we replace the batteries to get a full charge. So kind of the same thing applies to a system. There is still some energy there, but it just can no, it no longer can do the work. It can't, the remote just won't work anymore. So not all energy can be used, and disorder or that entropy tends to increase as you move through a system. I love this example. This may look like your room until your mom yells at you to clean your room. So if you're looking at this messy room, it's really disorganized. I couldn't find much of anything. And we say that's an increase in entropy. And it may help you think of it as high entropy. But remember the definition of entropy is a measure. And you use the terms when you measure something, increase and decrease. So that's why it seems a little awkward to use that. If I look at my clean room, I have low messiness. I know that doesn't sound right. But um, low entropy, or in other words, there's a measure or a decrease of entropy because there's more order involved. So here's just another example. This is a perfect example. Now let's say I haven't lit the log yet. So we just have a log sitting here, which is used for fuel, and it's going to produce both heat and light. So here's the illustration of heat being given off at the energy level. So before I lit this log, it has a lot of free energy, a lot of potential energy it's going to burn. So it's an increase in free energy. So it's like a fully charged battery. And below the log, if I have not lit it yet, there's no ashes, it's not messy. So the disorder or the entropy is low or there's an increase in entropy. Now when I light the log, let's say this is about halfway burnt, okay? So that's what this is describing up here. So the free energy is decreasing, or it decreases, so that is being burnt up, a lot of heat and light given off, and underneath are a lot of ashes. I cannot relight these ashes for more energy, so it's used up. It's pretty messy, it's increased. And then this description just uh, goes over um, what I said verbally. Hopefully, hopefully you've noticed that there's a reciprocal going on here. 
So as one increases, the other is going to decrease. And we're talking about free energy and entropy. That's the reciprocal of one another. Okay, so let's look at this with the second law. So the energy is changing from one form to the next. And then I already said that that energy is lost into the environment, <clears throat> excuse me, in the form of heat. So here are these arrows again. I mentioned in that other diagram had the arrows. Of course, it was going down, not across. And it had the description that it was feeding on. This, there's no description saying what it's doing. So it's a presumed that the energy is flowing. So this illustrates a food chain, food web, collectively. Energy is flowing through the environment. So sun to plants, chemical reactions, heat given off. Plants, this little caterpillar, so as a primary consumer or herbivore, heat given off when it goes through that digestion process, and so on and so forth. Now hopefully you notice that most of the organisms are pointing to this circle down here that has some little organisms in it. We have like a little centipede, bacteria, earthworms. Those are our decomposers. They do the recycling for our environment. Now you'll, um, there are three different terms down here. Um, there's those vores that tells us what they're eating. Detrovores means it's eating what's called detritus. And here's a spelling if you need that. Detritus is um, broken down matter. So when these plants and these animals die, they start to decompose. And what helps accelerate that decomposition are these decomposers. Okay, So these feeders are feeding on detritus, dead matter and fecal matter. Okay, so I don't care which term you use, they all would be fine. Okay, what goes along with the second law is also something called the 10% rule. And here's the definition of that, very simple definition. It illustrates that energy as it moves from one level to the next, so like from plants to primary consumers or plants to, if you want to say herbivores, um, there's only 10% of the energy that's transferred. That's why it's the 10% rule. So here's the example, and I don't get scared because of all the numbers and these units, kilocalories, etc. I just try to put it in very simple numbers and to try and find a, a unit you might be familiar with, calories. So we have all talk about calories all the time. And I'm not sure if you can tell, but there is a kind of a insinuating a pyramid here. Okay. The base of our pyramid are the producers, the plants and here's the energy from the sun. So if these plants right here have in it 10,000 kilocalories available, as I, the rabbits are eating those plants, heat's lost, we talked about that, but as it moves from one level to the next, only 1,000 kilocalories are going to be available for the rabbits to eat. The rest is not usable or it could be what the plants need to survive. Okay, so that's all the energy that these rabbits can get out of the plants for themselves, 10%. And then if I go from the snake to the rabbit, another 10%. So the snake is only getting out 100 kilocalories from the 1,000 calories than from the 10,000 that came from the plants. So it just, every level it loses or there's only 10% available. Okay, food pyramid, um, again, the producers are at the base, and then here's my primary, secondary, and then it could have been labeled tertiary consumer. Now, what I want to point out about this is that if I inverted this triangle, so this was at the bottom, okay, and then these are the producers, still labeled the same but just flipped. If I tried to balance this pyramid on this point at the top, it would fall over. It would topple over. So if an ecosystem was built this way, where I had very few plants, a lot more primary consumers, et cetera, as I went up, so I had a lot more of the tertiary or the top predators, there wouldn't be enough food available, and that ecosystem would collapse or topple over. Okay, now we've been talking about energy and free energy and heat lost into the environment. So now we're going to, if you ever see diagrams, has a lot of different arrows, always look for some kind of key so you understand what they're talking about. 
always look at all of the illustrations. Okay, so the red arrows here is telling me, okay, that's the energy moving through the environment. So you notice that it's coming from the sun, going from the plants to the producers. Here I'm losing some heat. And then it's going to the consumers. And then down to these, these are mushrooms, or our decomposers. That's another decomposer. And then also there's a red arrow going from the producers to the decomposers. So when these two organisms, plants and consumers, die, then the decomposers are going to break down the nutrients and release it back into the soil. Okay? So that's the flow of energy, and that's why the red arrows only stop at the decomposers. Now if I was tracking the nutrients, the blue arrows, you know there's no, notice there's no nutrients going from the sun to the plants. It starts with the plants for the nutrients. So here the nutrients are going from the plants to the consumers, decomposers, following that same path as for the energy, plants to the decomposers. But now, instead of going to stopping at the decomposers, now from the decomposers it's going to the inorganic nutrient pool. So that's why you find mushrooms around rotting logs, okay? They're breaking that down into inorganic nutrients. That would be my nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. That's what plants need in the soil to grow. So new plants would use those nutrients to grow. Um, the compost pile, that's why you have a lot of heat. Sometimes the middle of the compost pile can get up to about 120 degrees because of all the activity and chemical reactions of breaking down that dead matter into those inorganic nutrients. So the energy is flowing through the webs. So here it's interconnected. Okay, so this makes it a web and then heat's released to the environment. Now, all systems, no matter what, tend to become more disorganized. It's moving toward entropy. So every time you eat something, um, it's going to go through the digestive process and it's going to become messy. I don't think I have to say any more about that. But it's pulling the nutrients out and it's leaving behind waste, energy that cannot be used again. So life is compatible with the second law. I just love this image of this chimpanzee. Um, the actual, the caption is that he's making a mask out of it. But here it shows that he's eating the watermelon rind. So if this chimpanzee eats this watermelon, through the digestion it's going to break that down. And then a little bit later, he's going to have to eat again to get some more nutrients, calories out of it. Now, when scientists wrote the <coughs> laws of bioenergetics and thermodynamics, they really wrote that for a closed system. So what is a closed system? A couple of examples, thermos and a thermostat. So if you set your thermostat at home at 70 degrees, and whether it's winter or summer and the AC or the furnace kicks on, it's going to keep it really close to 70 degrees inside the house. Now, life is compatible with what's called an open system because it's hard to control that because things are going in and out and energy is going in and out, raw materials are going in and out. So really, living things are more characteristic of an open system. But the laws were written for what's called a closed system. So I hope that, that all of that makes sense. Um, Please make sure that you read the pages that go along with this lecture. Add those to your cue notes. And I would definitely look over it a few times, look at all the diagrams and figures in the book. Okay, I'll see you next time.